committee will come back to order. We have pending an en bloc amendment for four or five, uh, five separate amendments. As I understand it, there are two of the five uh, f for which there's no uh, opposition. And I'd like to put the vote on those two, and then we'll recognize members to discuss the other three. Mr. Welch? White, pardon? The two are uh, amendment by Ms. Eshoo and Mr. Rogers, called the Energy Efficient Information and Communications Technology, and the uh, one, one of the two amendments by Ms. Baldwin, uh, and this is the um, uh, Motor Market Assessment Commercial Awareness Program. Are we ready for the vote on those two amendments? All those in favor of those two amendments will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. <coughs> the ayes have it and the amendments are agreed to. Now we have three uh, pending amendments on block and the chair would like to see who would like to uh, be recognized to discuss any of those three amendments. Mr. Shimkus, did you want to speak on those amendments? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And, and I'm not going to take a, a lot of time, but on each one of these, there's a, just a couple questions and a couple points. One is on the, uh, the amendment offered by Mr. Welch and Mr. Gett, the National Energy Efficiency Goals. I guess the first question would be, what is the goals based on? Can anyone answer that question? This is uh, Mr. Welch, and I'll yield to Mr. Welch. Uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Shimkus. Uh, there have been a couple of studies, one by the United Nations Foundation that concluded. That doesn't help me. <laughs> Just a joke. Go ahead. Sorry. Right. Uh, that, that suggested just under the present uh, 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 arrangement, we could likely get efficiency improvements of 1.2 percent. And the, the goal here is, in effect, the challenge to raise that to 2.5 percent. Uh, yeah. Can I just follow up? And why 2.5, 1.2 .2 to 2.5? Why, how did we grab 2.5 out of the air? Well, I'll tell you, uh, a lot of us thought it could be higher. Uh, so the goal, you've got, you've got to pick a number. And 2.5 is about 40 percent above uh, what, under present arrangements, without uh, the passage of this legislation, without an aggressive effort to actually invest in efficiency in this can bill. I, is can I follow up steps. on that? I'm, I'm going to try to make good deal. use of the time. Is that, uh, is there any scientific yeah. study that talks about the, Mr. I, I yield my Good time to Mr. Get. Yes, thank you. Uh, the UN Foundation did a report that showed that we could increase energy efficiency by 2.5 percent. And if we <coughs> did that in just the G8 countries, then we would uh, reduce G8 energy demand by about 20 percent in 2030. It's important to note that um, in Mr. Welch's and my amendment, this is a, a goal, it's not a requirement. And so we think that under the UN report, it's doable. Um, energy efficiency is one of the um, least recognized but most effective way um, to meet our, our challenges. And so, so uh, we think that this is a reasonable amount. Can I, and if, back. I, if, if I could follow up with any one of the, uh, the authors, what happens with this plan once it's developed? Uh, I yield my time to Mr. Welch. I don't know what Mr. Welch, your mic's not on. Thank you. The, the information is provided uh, by the Secretary of Energy and EPA uh, to Congress. It allows us kind of an. Is that to each member's office? No, that's just another joke. Well, you'll you'll find <laughs> it, Mr. Shimkus. Basically, it's about one setting a goal. And then, two, uh, tracking the information as to how we're achieving the goal. And it also uh, would break down information by different uh, type of activity so that we could assess as we're going along what's working better in one place versus another. So uh, really it's about having a goal for efficiency and then tracking it to see how successful we are with our policies to achieve greater efficiency. And, in the and I appreciate energy. my uh, time is quickly expiring. And I, I want to thank the two authors. Of, you've answered a lot of questions, and I appreciate that. Let me go to Ms. Matsui, who's uh, obviously my colleague and uh, co-author of DERA, which we have been celebrating over the last couple of days. Um, this amendment, in essence, is going to pay utilities to plant trees. Is that correct? Uh, 
actually what it does is have a grant program in essence and uh, federal monies go to that and it has to be matched one for one for private monies. So the whole premise of the cap and trade which would then uh, have uh, money and people purchasing credits to force, force the nation as a carbon sequestration type of product, this would be in addition to, is this not duplicative? I guess that's the question. I mean, I think my, the no, problem with the bill is we're piling on numerous I, issues, and, and it seems like if, if the cap-and-trade system works, well, then why do we have this program that, that takes off additional money? It is not duplicative. The U.S. Forest Service already runs, obviously, the Urban Community Forestry Program, but its intent is simply to increase the number of urban trees in this country, not to drive up building efficiency and drive down ratepayer cost. So, you know, we've heard a lot about the little guy uh, from the colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And if this amendment is adopted, it would be a perfect example of how we're looking out for the little guy because it will lower the amount of money consumers pay for electricity. Gentlemen. And, and Mr. Chairman, if, if I could just, and I'm be finished with, I got one more. There's three Without amendments. Without objection, the gentleman will be given another one minute. That will be the order. Yeah, and I, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I would just say, uh, I'm the one who's raising the little guy debate, and I would just say that giving grants to corporations to plant trees uh, doesn't seem like it's helping the little guy. Um, on the last amendment, which is by Ms. Baldwin, I think my colleague, Mr. Whitfield, did a great job of identifying that there's $2.8 trillion already authorized in this bill, and there is concern for many of us about the additional authorization. 80 million for 2011, 75 million 2012, 70 million for 2013, 65 million for 2014. There's going to be a time when when we cannot pay for all the funding that we're we're incurring, and that's why rates increase. So, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Any uh, yes, gentlelady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's Ms. Blackburn from Tennessee. And I move to strike the last word. You're not just the gentlelady? <laughs> gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you. Thank you, sir. for five minutes. I, I, I do have a couple of questions I would like to ask Ms. Matsui, if I uh, may do so, on her amendment. I find the amendment such an interesting take on, um, and I, I do look at this and see it as being very duplicative and redundant in its efforts. You know, I, I come from a family that has always participated enormously in conservation efforts, um, whether it was Farm Bureau 4-H Club or my mother with Garden Clubs of America. My mother received the Keep America Beautiful Lifetime Achievement Award in 1997 for the work that she has done starting programs exactly like the gentlelady from California is mentioning in her bill. Now, we have wonderful not-for-profits that, that go about this work, and she does reference them in her bill, but these organizations for decades have been planting trees. So, in addition to the U.S. Forest Service carrying out some of this good work, we have garden clubs all around the country. We have Boy Scout and Girl Scout clubs that work on Arbor Days planting trees. So is it the gentle lady's intent that all of these organizations will be able to draw down this one dollar for dollar match? Would they use that to um, grow their programs or would this have the unintended consequence of doing away with the corporate contributions that they receive, the charitable contributions they receive in order to help carry out those programs. Have, have we thought through what that would do to these not-for-profits who have for decades been engaged in, in this type of work? And I yield to the gentlelady for a response. Um, yes, I'd like to respond. First of all, I really appreciate garden clubs also, and I think they really fill a wonderful place in our communities. The critical difference between my amendment and things like garden clubs, and the reason we need the amendment is because utilities need to plant the right tree in the right place. 
in order to get the kind of efficiency. Reclaiming my time. So then the individuals that put a lot of work into these efforts, our assumption, the arrogance of an assumption by us in Congress would be that these volunteers do not plant the trees in the right place. And I just would have a tremendous amount of concern about what this would do to these organizations that put effort into carrying forth these programs, even began these programs. We General can, Lady yields to Yes, I'll be happy to yield. I, I would think those groups would welcome yes. this proposal. It's a voluntary one. It's not mandatory. Uh, they're doing the best job they can, and, and I'm pleased to hear about your mother's involvement. It, they, they do a great service. They make our, our, our communities more livable. What this uh, proposal would do is uh, no mandate, but it's an option for local utility companies who want to reduce consumer energy bills. They can do it through tree planting. And when you get shade from trees, less electricity is used. So if a, if a utility wants to do that, as I understand it, uh, they have to match the money. And they know that they're, they're helping their, their ratepayers save money. So I, I think groups, uh, volunteer groups are great, and they're doing the best they can. But this would help. And I, and I think utilities would probably want to engage them in the activity. I thank the chairman for the explanation. And I reclaim my time. I think that as we look at taking a program that has been very successful in the not-for-profit sector and pulling that in, institutionalizing it, and making it a government program that we need to be very careful about how we go about that, I would think that we would not want to take steps that are going to hurt the not-for-profit sector and their good work diminishing the work they've done while we say global warming and fighting global warming and uh, paying umbrage to global warming is the objective of the legislation General that Lady we're bringing forward. For and I, I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the chair will recognize himself. I, I, I'd be interested in whether you think that um, faith-based initiatives have harmed the religious and volunteer groups that were doing great things in the community running uh, drug abuse programs and uh, other things that uh, where they served a very worthwhile purpose and the government wanted to them to have them uh, do the work and not set up government agencies to do it so I, I just show you a different aspect of it I hear what you're saying and I wouldn't want those nonprofit groups to be pushed out of the way at all but I think this would expand it we'd have um, more opportunities for people to do things together we I hope we we will, we, I just want to give you a different explanation. Yep. Further discussion on the amendments? Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Oh, uh, the gentleman from Vermont is on the. But then after him, I would like to. Uh, Mr. Welch, are you seeking recognition? The gentleman's recognized. Uh, yeah, uh, just briefly, uh, I just want to speak to the National Efficiency Improvement Goals. You know, we've been having a very contentious debate. Uh, about the climate, about the consumers, and about jobs that will be affected. And efficiency is a means of doing three things that we all agree need to be done. Uh, we want to protect the climate. We obviously want to provide relief to the consumer. Lower electric bills will do that. And we want to create jobs. And efficiency, by definition, requires investment in local economies. And the folks who have those jobs are your local electrician, local plumber, uh, local mechanic. And what this National Energy Efficient Goals uh, Amendment does, and I thank uh, Diana DeGett and Chris Murphy, what it does is state very explicitly uh, something that is important for this country to do, and that is to pursue efficiency for the benefits that are ours to be had if we make the effort. And it can be something that unifies us because you're a winner whether you're in a coal state, in a hydro state, uh, in an oil state. Uh, so I thank my, uh, my, my co-sponsors and at this point uh, would like to yield uh, to the member from Colorado, Diana DeGette. Uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank the sponsor for his leadership. Um, just, to, just to add, the other thing our amendment does is it requires the secretary to develop a strategic plan based on 
uh, based on the, this, these goals and to see how we can achieve them. I think that, I think Mr. Welch and I would both agree that as we move along, energy efficiency is really sort of the low hanging fruit of this whole debate. And if people really work towards energy efficiency, then we will achieve our goals of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also, most importantly, we'll save consumers money and stimulate the local economies. Um, I, I wish we could do more with efficiency, but I think this is a good first start in this bill. And Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you and everybody else to improve um, efficiency standards as best we can. And with that, I'll yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Terry. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I have to hand it uh, to the authors. Uh, this seems very thorough. Uh, it goes in and makes sure that anyone who is going to be planting the trees is going to be properly uh, certified and knowing uh, the proper distance to plant the tree from a building foundation and air conditioning units and driveways and property fences and pre-existing utility infrastructures, any septic systems, uh, swimming pools. Uh, they've got to have a certain uh, education, I think, uh, on eligibility. Uh, so I, I commend them for uh, the thoroughness. A uh, couple of things that stood out to me uh, that I want to ask about is, uh, first of all, I, I understand maybe not the rest of the country is intelligent as Nebraskans, but if we want to plant a tree in our yard to help shade it, uh, we pretty well know it's west to northwest, uh, so we can save some time here. Uh, to block the uh, winter winds, uh, it's north side of the house. Uh, but uh, size does matter with trees in being able to accomplish this. So, you know, having the uh, retail generator pay for a nice little red bud tree in my front yard on the northwest corner uh, will make my yard look very beautiful, but will do absolutely nothing for energy efficiency. So uh, the one thing that I didn't see in here is size of trees, uh, deciduous versus uh, pine. Of course, in Nebraska, having uh, trees that drop leaves in the winter uh, on the north side of your house is fairly meaningless. Uh, so even though it's uh, how many pages, 15 pages on how to plant trees and the conditions uh, for being able to meet uh, and actually receive grant monies to plant the tree, I was wondering if uh, size was part of the discussion. Uh, the gentleman yield? Yes. Why would you think a utility would take up this option? They have to put in some of their own money to do this tree planting. The idea is that they would plant it so that uh, there'd be less electricity used because of the shade. Uh, it's, they don't so have what to credit do, it. do they receive? What credit they, do they receive? They just they get to plant a tree, and maybe and Mr. Chairman, it's like it. uh, the Arbor Day Foundation that gave my eight-year-old a tree, a nice uh, pine tree that was four inches tall. You know, that's going to be 20 years before it has any effect. Well, they'll probably have we to we get to pay $200 for a six-inch pine tree? No, no, we'll probably have to do more fully grown trees, huh? But it doesn't say they that. They have in those here. in Nebraska. And I guess the bottom line, Mr. Chairman, is I think we're getting silly now. I yield back. Okay. Any further recognition on this? Uh, Amendment, gentlemen's recognition. Mr. Chairman, I won't. I hopefully won't take much time here. But this is, uh, I think, what strikes us as odd about this whole bill, and is very symptomatic of the problem with this. You use the word; it's their own money. So let me get this right. They have a guaranteed rate of return, of which even this bill authorizes to go back to uh, ratepayers in order to recoup their costs. So ratepayers pay for half the tree. Then we create a new government program that's a lot more expensive to even find, get the tree, get the contract, to get the tree to the place of which uh, ratepayers are paying half. And oh, by the way, taxpayers are paying for the other half of the tree, which are ratepayers. I mean, you have just charged the bill to the very people you're saddling with the largest energy tax in the history of the United States. And your logic, and I, and I do assume you believe it, is no, no, it's, it's free, it's great, it's wonderful, nobody really pays for it. This comes out of somebody's pocket. 
for a shade tree. And if it saves money, I'll guarantee you somebody's clever enough to go plant the tree themselves without a large, very regulated government mandate about how they, you know, the, the size of the tree, the scope of the tree, and where the tree goes. It is ludicrous. And this is absolutely exemplary of why this bill is so bad. I mean, it went from a climate change bill to a, uh, a global warming bill. Now it's not quite that yesterday. Now it's a jobs bill. No, no, it's not really a jobs bill. Now it's a new energy bill. No, it's a tax bill on people who are trying to make it back home. I, I, uh, Gentleman yield. I, you, you can have the remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman. I just, you can tell why we're frustrated, because people back home are paying for every single penny of this, unless, of course, you're in a district, as Mr. Booyer pointed out, where you've exempted yourselves. I uh, would yield you the remainder of my time. I thank you very much for yielding, and I, I do sense the frustration that you must have. But I think Mr. Scalise was very uh, wise when he said yesterday, I believe it was Mr. Scalise, if you dig a hole, if you dig a hole, I believe you ought to plant a tree. <laughs> on, on, on top of the rate payer, apparently. All right. Um, any further discussion? Are we ready for the vote? I think we. I think we're ready for the vote. You, Mr. Murphy. Do you, uh, well, we'll recognize you, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, I wanted to get back to Mr. Welsh's amendment and speak uh, very quickly in support of it. Uh, you know, it's been said that this country is the Saudi Arabia of energy consumption, and uh, Mr. Welsh's amendment, which I'm happy to join him on, is, I think, a um, very important reminder to us that some of the greatest savings that we can immediately achieve is through energy efficiency. We have a small little company headquartered in Connecticut, United Technologies, which has expanded uh, greatly over the past three to four years and at the same time has had a net reduction in their energy consumption and their water consumption, um, vastly disproportional to the excess production happening at that facility. It's because they've invested the time in trying to figure out ways to do things more efficiently. In the Reggie cap and trade uh, system in New England and northeastern states, by putting almost all of the revenues from uh, those auctions back into energy efficiency, we have kept uh, the rate base and the rates for consumers relatively stable because we have pushed down and are going to continue to push down the demand side uh, of our energy market, uh, which will counterbalance against some of the pass-throughs uh, due to the auction uh, prices. Uh, energy efficiency has so far to go in this country, and by simply setting a goal here, I think we're reminding everyone from uh, end uh, consumers uh, to those that are producing the energy in the first place, who are often wasting more energy in producing it than they actually send out onto the grid, uh, that we can do so much uh, to try to get to the goals in this bill through energy efficiency. And I'm uh, thankful to Representative Welsh and others for bringing it before us today. Will the gentleman yield to Ms. Castor? Uh, absolutely. I'd yield the balance of my time to Ms. Castor. Thank you very much. I just wanted to speak uh, in favor of Ms. Matsui's amendment. Um, because in Florida, our per capita residential electricity demand is among the highest in the country. Uh, largely because of air conditioning use. We need air conditioning desperately uh, during the summer months. Uh, and when you combine that with poorly insulated homes that are inefficient, it causes us to use far more energy than we need. And we know that uh, throughout the entire country that heating and cooling of homes accounts for nearly 60 percent of ele residential electricity use. So when you're able to plant a tree in a strategic location in concert with the utility, this is a cost-saving proposal for consumers. What's more cost-efficient, to, to target a few subdivisions and plant trees to save energy or do you have to uh, replace your, your AC equipment with, with higher load capacity? It's much more efficient to, to plant a few trees. This is an important consumer provision, and I thank Ms. Matsui for offering it today. Time is yielded back. We'll now proceed to a vote on the following three amendments in block. A Baldwin Amendment Number 40, the Motor Efficiency Rebate Program, Matsui 35, Tree Planting Program, Welch to get Murphy 96, the National Energy Efficiency Goals. All those in favor of those of the uh, amendments in block will say aye. Aye. 
Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it and the amendments are agreed to. The chair uh, asks if there are further amendments to Title II. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Scalise. For, uh, for what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? Do you have an amendment? I have to an title amendment II? to Title II. And I, uh, and I want the clerk to inform us whether the time limit has been met. It's at the desk titled Scalise-201. It is timely, Mr. Chairman. Uh, clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Scalise. Strike section 201 and make necessary conforming changes. Gentleman um, from Louisiana is recognized on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Section 201 of this cap and trade energy tax creates a national building code, uh, something that we don't have in place today. We, uh, if you look across the country right now, 30 states have their own state building codes. And a number of states actually go even to the local level uh, where they have codes that are based on different cities or, or different parishes or counties. Uh, just to use Louisiana for an example, uh, right after Hurricane Katrina, we, our legislature, passed a statewide building code. We didn't have one before. Uh, we created a statewide building code, and we took into account in our code uh, the various segmented differences between regions of our state. In fact, the code is different in South Louisiana, where our main threats are hurricanes and flooding, uh, much different than they are in the northern part of the state of Louisiana, where uh, tornadoes are a bigger threat. And so if you look at the fact that 30 states have these types of statewide codes, this bill in Section 201 creates a federal code that would trump, throw out all of those state building codes that have been worked on for years in many cases. We worked on ours for months just for our state's code. Here, with really no debate, we're creating a federal code that trumps all of the state's codes, in some cases what actually lower the standards that states have for building. Uh, and, and if you go back to why we have building codes and why states have done this, uh, per the purpose typically is to protect safety and health. Safety and health have always been the main driving factors behind a building code. What this bill does in Section 201, it's literally taking global warming and using global warming to trump safety and health. Because now, if, if I'm in South Louisiana and I want to rebuild after hurricane damage, which, by the way, we had 120,000 homes in Louisiana that had more than 50 percent damage due to Hurricane Katrina. Under this bill in Section 201, when people are rebuilding those 120,000 homes, they would have to follow the federal building code. And in many cases, that would mean they can't use the same types of strength that they might want to use in their windows. They might want to use stronger windows because they don't want the storm to blow out their windows. But under this bill, a federal standard could actually say that their windows are out of the federal code. And then what does that mean? Well, let's go to the bill and look at the penalties, because there are actually civil penalties. In this bill, we're actually creating a global warming police. Go to page 235. The secretary may set and collect reasonable inspection fees to cover the cost of inspections required. So number one, they can come in, the federal government can come in and inspect your house and send you the bill. And if they find that you're out of compliance with this new federal code, the secretary shall assess a civil penalty for violations of this section. And then further, going to page 236, each day of unlawful occupancy shall be considered a separate violation. We're setting up a global warming Gestapo that can literally come in, and now this new term, unlawful occupancy. So now living in your home is considered unlawful under this bill. This is ludicrous. If you go, well, first of all, let's go to the U.S. Constitution and look at the Tenth Amendment. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution says the states have the right to do what they're doing if they're not prohibited by the Constitution. So states, over 30 of them, have established building codes. This bill comes in and basically says throw out the Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and the federal government's going to throw out your building code. I'd like to submit the
the U.S. Constitution into the record, if I can, by unanimous consent, so that it can be reviewed, because I think we also need to go to another section that talks about unlawful occupancy. The only part of the Constitution that talks about unlawful occupancy of your home says in Amendment 3, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house. So basically, the federal government and the Constitution says the protection as a homeowner gives you the ability to determine who comes in your house. Here we're saying each day of unlawful occupancy shall be considered a separate violation and you will be subject to federal civil fines. That's what this bill does. That's what Section 201 does. And other people have looked at this. You've got a number of groups that have come out in strong opposition to Section 201 and support my amendment. I'd like to read and enter, enter into the record a letter from about nine different organizations, including the National Association of Home Builders, the National Association of Realtors, the Building Owners and Manage Managers Association International, the National Apartment Association, and a number of others who said the proposal creates a new authority for the federal government to police building codes, holds developers and owners of buildings, including homeowners, liable for not reaching federal energy efficiency mandates, even if the buildings are presumably in compliance with applicable local building codes and establishes a civil penalty for violators of this section of the bill, this measure would have a chilling effect on development and property transfer across the spectrum of real properties. Now, we're in a housing slump right now. Why would we want to be passing legislation that creates a federal building code with civil penalties and tells people who live in, that, in their houses that they're unlawfully occupying that house if they don't meet this new federal building code when they're in compliance with their own state's federal building code? This is ludicrous. I'll enter these letters into the record, including this letter from the National Association of Home Builders, uh, which goes even further and talks about uh, some of the legal problems with this and, and also the... Uh, the shortfalls, how this would adversely affect homeowners in this country who would be subject to this global warming police that would be created to come in and drag you out of your house and fine you civilly in federal court because maybe you wanted to protect your family at a higher level than the federal government. Gentlemen's, uh, does gentleman yield back to balance? The oh, gentleman's time has expired. Um, the chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Utah, Mr. Mathis. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike. Last word. The gentleman is recognized for that purpose. I think uh, when we look at Section 201, um, there are certain um, aspects of that section that do warrant some change, and I will be offering an amendment to address those issues. Because I think, because I believe that the federal cause of action is, is a concern. But throwing out the whole section doesn't make sense to me, and that's what this amendment would do. There are significant opportunities, and I think everybody knows it, in terms of energy efficiency in our country. Significant opportunities to create lower costs for people who occupy these facilities, uh, significant opportunities to lower energy use. Um, this is one where it, most everyone agrees energy efficiency is a good policy for us to pursue in this country. Um, buildings represent roughly 40 percent of U.S. energy use. Um, that's a big deal in our country. U.S. buildings are responsible for 10 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Section 201 sets targets for building efficiency that seeks to achieve savings of 50 percent above current codes by 2016. And local agencies can meet these targets with their own building codes or by the Secretary of Energy establishing codes. These targets are feasible. Um, these codes have been endorsed by a number of industry and consumer groups, uh, including the Alliance to Save Energy, the ACEEE, National Association of State Energy Officials. Um, I just think we ought to be careful here in terms of taking meat acts and taking all of Section 201 out. We ought to address what is problematic language. As I said, I will be offering an amendment that removes this new federal cause of action against property owners for noncompliance because I do think that is an overreach and we ought to address that issue. But I would recommend uh, voting against this amendment and I would encourage people to take a look at the amendment that I will offer after that. I yield to Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield to the gentleman from Vermont. Sure, I'd yield to Mr. Welch, yes. I will. Uh, well, I, I see that the, the gentleman from Michigan was seeking recognition. I'll yield to, to him. I, oh. Yield back. I guess those bells tell you everybody ought to listen fast. <laughs> this is not the first time we have seen this amendment, nor is it the first time we have seen this language. For years, we've been trying to address this question in the energy bills that we have been pushing through this committee. During the last Congress, we tried, and the real estate lobby got similar language out. 
This is a very modest proposal. It is one which is needed if we're going to address the problems. Buildings are enormous users of energy. The best way to address this use is by seeing to it it's properly done in the first place with a proper building code <clears throat> and to see to it that communities do not have their building codes tinkered with by uh, builders and by real estate folks. The end result of that is that another building goes on the market which is not suitable to the needs of the country in terms of energy conservation. This is, as I've said before, a very modest proposal. The buildings that we're talking about last 120 years. Efficiency pr improvements pay for themselves in five to seven years. And when spread over a 30-year mortgage, the cost of efficiency improvements are more than covered by energy cost savings from day one. I think that if we're going to be serious about this business of dealing with energy and energy conservation and climate change, we have no excuse but to do exactly what the bill would do here. Inefficient buildings are a drag on the economy. Energy costs over the 30-year life of a mortgage could be as high as a $100,000. And a house that's more than 50% 50, 50 efficient could save $50,000. This gives the, the owner of that house a much better source of revenue for his home and his family than might meet the eye. Because kilowatt hours cost the same no matter whether you're rich or poor, energy costs are highly regressive and hit the poor folks the hardest. Inefficient homes can help keep the poorest families poor by keeping away from that family food, clothes, and everything else that they would spend that money for. This part of the population needs energy efficiency far more than does any other part of our society. States and local governments normally adopt and enforce building codes, but have traditionally done so for fire, wiring, plumbing, safety, but not for energy efficiency. And if we're going to achieve the goal of energy efficiency and a massive saving for our people, doing so by seeing to it that the building codes represent what they should, an honest mechanism for saving and conserving energy is the best way to do it. So I urge my colleagues to support the bill as is, reject the amendment, and write a better piece of legislation. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think I already nodded that I would recognize the gentleman from yeah. Georgia. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I move to strike the last word and, and support the amendment of my colleague from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Uh, you know, overall, it, 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 it just seems to me that this, this uh, uh, Section 201 uh, is typical of, of the entire bill and particularly typical of the title that we just finished with, and that is the Renewable Energy Standards. It's a, it's a one-size-fits-all uh, approach uh, to the entire country. And what Mr. Scalise was pointing out is that there are differences in, in, uh, in climate and geography and, and humidity and that sort of thing and, and uh, the type of windows that would be appropriate uh, in Minnesota uh, or the northeast of our country uh, may not at all be appropriate for a building, uh, either a residential or commercial building in, in a moist, uh, humid, hot uh, south Louisiana. Uh, so I don't disagree uh, with the uh, distinguished former chairman in regard to uh, wanting to have energy efficiency and doing, you know, putting best practices forward and making recommendations. Uh, but, the, but the problem, as I see it, and I, I think that's the whole purpose of, of this amendment, is there's no room for maneuvering. Indeed, as, uh, as the gentleman from Louisiana said, that, you know, Big Brother can come right in and, and uh, fine you for every day that, you, you live in your own home or, or go to work in your own office building if you're not in compliance with a federal standard. Uh, I think this is way, way overreaching uh, and, and there, there needs to be uh, some sanity uh, brought to this issue. And that's the same concern, as I say, that I had, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, in regard to uh, the renewable energy standards uh, that are very, 
very burdensome for the southeast when you do not include uh, nuclear and uh, hydroelectric power uh, and where there's not a reliable, consistent source of wind and solar. Uh, in my state of Georgia, only uh, not even 1 percent, maybe 1 percent of our electricity right now is generated uh, by renewable and 60 percent uh, by coal and maybe 20 percent by nuclear. So here we're coming along with a massive 900-page bill. This title, uh, e maybe even more onerous than Title I in regard to one size fits all. Uh, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I don't want to drown the baby in the bathwater either. Uh, and I yield back. When the, the, the gentleman uh, yields back. Uh, there are approximately uh, eight minutes left to go on uh, three roll calls on the House floor. Uh, so uh, at this time, uh, we will recess with the request to the members that they return here very rapidly after those roll calls. There are many uh, amendments that we have to uh, process. Uh, so we'll take a, a, re a recess, uh, but uh, please return as quickly as possible. As you just heard, votes underway on the floor of the House. So this meeting of the Energy, or rather the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee on Energy and Climate Change Legislation, taking a break now to allow members to uh, vote on the floor. This is day three of the markup session. Once the committee approves this bill, it will go to the House floor for consideration. While we wait for members to return to the committee room, we'll show you this morning's question time with British Prime Minister Gordon Brown. Today he talked about unemployment and small business financing, and he paid tribute to Speaker Michael Martin, who plans to resign from the British House of Commons June 21st. Questions to the Prime Minister, Paul Rowan. Uh, question number one, Mr. Speaker. M Mr. Speaker, before listing my engagements, I'm sure the whole House will wish to join me in expressing our condolences to the family and friends of Royal Marine Jason Mackey, who was killed in Afghanistan last week. He and others who have